guys remember in 2007, 2008 or so, when everybody had their eyes on the culinary world of Spain and the molecular gastronomy was taking off and then the buzzword of the year, for like a couple years, was deconstructed. Everything was picked apart into little pieces. Do you guys remember this? Where it's like it couldn't just be a chocolate cake, it had to be cake, you know, like a crumb cake and then a piping of icing and then, a, you know, a brandy cherry and it was all just very, it was everywhere, right? But what is deconstruction, you know? I think as cooks we all understand how this applies to food, but let's just talk about conceptually what it involves, okay? So deconstruction is just separating the contents of a dish and then presenting them together. It is boiling a dish down to its core idea and then rebuilding it up from there. So for instance, something deconstructed could be like, instead of tomato soup and grilled cheese, you could do like, you could thicken the soup and freeze it into little logs and bread it and fry it and then serve it with a, a cheese fondue. So you'd have like tomato croquettes and a cheese fondue. It's just like unfamiliar presentations and preparations of familiar ingredients and tastes. So breaking it apart, understanding what it's made of, and putting it back together. So if you remember, in an earlier video, I talked about the idea that we could start thinking about our thoughts and feelings as unfamiliar ingredients or herbs. And now we're going to expand on that. So the process of deconstructing a dish really just highlights how every flavor is unique and special. And what people really enjoyed about this phenomena in the culinary world is that it allowed diners to experience a meal on their own terms. Ooh, see where I'm going with this? So most people don't get to try each ingredient of a cake separately. You know? Most, think, most people never try every step of the pasta sauce to know what it tastes like in the beginning and what it tastes like in the end. You guys already know how to do this. You know how to compartmentalize in your brain. You know how to pick apart an idea when you focus on it. You know how to come up with a dish that has crazy ingredients together that nobody else would have thought of, but you understood the connection between them. And so what I'm proposing is that we are actually, as cooks, primed for self-development like this. We just don't know that it exists. <laughs> so our goal, you know, the goal of deconstruction and our goal as a community here is to make our dish more fun, right? Because right now there's a lot of bitter elements in there, you know? There's probably a lot of a... Uh, a lot of anger, you know, sprinkles of sadness and I don't know, foams of despair. <laughs> but our dish, the flavor's not right. And we have to recognize that. So we're going to start deconstructing what it's actually made of to decide what stays and what goes. When you think about a dish, how do you conceptualize it? Do you taste something? I mean, everybody has their own creative process, but in the comments, I'd actually be really curious about your, your creative process when you're conceptualizing a, a new menu item from scratch. But I've noticed a common trend in all of the places that I've worked. You know, I've worked for three very, very well-known chefs, and they are, to date, the people that I consider mentors because their mindset was different than everybody else. You know, there's a lot of people out there that think they're great chefs. The ones who are actually great don't think that they're great. They just think a lot, <laughs> a lot. They let their mind kind of wander into that crazy territory. And I don't know, that's one of the things that I always understood about food, you know, is that you kind of have to let your mind go a little bit into a place where most people's doesn't because that's what makes it you know that's when you have the best ideas and that's why we do this career isn't it because it gives us an outlet to be creative so the funny thing about the brain is that it responds to only two things 
the language we use, and the pictures we make in our mind. So if we're constantly using negative language to describe every aspect of our life, our dish is going to be negative, you know, our, our personal dish is going to be super negative, super bitter. But if we start flipping the things and we start describing these formerly, these formerly negative situations as more positive, then our whole dish is going to change, you know. So our aim with this is to change the form of the thought, not the thought itself. So when we have a thought and we realize that it's negative, that's awesome because we've already made a lot of progress in our own self-awareness. But when we realize it's negative, ask yourself, what if it wasn't? What if that wasn't the case? Start to understand why you might be thinking that. What's it actually making you feel? So one of my favorite internet therapists <laughs> who uh, actually helped me a lot when I was going through my own transition of, you know, living in the depths of despair to learning how to be a functioning human being uh, was a British therapist named Marissa Peart. And she introduced me to the concept of performance anxiety and how it relates to the rest of our lives. So her theory is that at our core, we all kind of have this, we develop this performance anxiety when we develop our egos around puberty, right? And performance anxiety is essentially the fear of being judged. It's, it's this idea that people need to like me for me to feel like I am likable, you know? And women are much more susceptible than this to men, but I've met so many coworkers now that I've just, you can tell, they just need the validation, they need the approval, they need to be told that they're doing a good job on a constant basis. And when they're not, it just wrecks them. And here's the thing. The most successful people are the ones who don't care if people are judging them because they're just doing their own thing, minding their own business, leaving the rest of the world out of it. And that's ultimately the goal that we want to get to, is we want to not feel embarrassed anymore. We want to not feel, not fear this criticism or judgment from others, because in reality, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Like, honestly, how often do you go in to your workstation and see your coworker and be like, wow, their hair really looks like shit today? Like, People don't do that that often. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but at the same time, like, why do you give a flying fuck what your coworker's hair looks like? If you're having those thoughts, start asking yourself why you care. And if you're thinking that other people are thinking those thoughts from you, start asking yourself why you care. Why is their approval so important to you? Why? <laughs> And I'm going to go out on a limb here and just say you're probably not going to get a good answer. You're probably going to justify it 20 ways till Sunday. But honestly, our goal is just to be real with ourselves and with each other. And you know, we can always tell when you're not being real. You know, when you're in a conversation with someone and like you can tell that they have the mask on. You, it's really weird and uncomfortable. Because you're just kind of like, okay, yeah, they really think I'm stupid, don't they? <laughs> but the hardest thing is to accept that that's how other people might see us. Because that's a very, very, very true reality for anybody who's struggling with any sort of mental illness is that we are often not aware of how the world actually sees us. You know, we build up these catastrophic fantasies in our own head about how every person that we interact with is just judging every single thing that makes us us and, you know, picking apart our appearance and our clothing and our posture and our way of speaking and but the truth is, 
Most people aren't even going to remember your name after 30 seconds, you know? <laughs> Most people are so wrapped up in their own head that they will never notice the blatantly obvious things like, you know, a giant stain on your shirt. I mean, okay, a little bit of a harsh example, but the things that we think are obvious to ourselves are often overlooked by everyone around us. So this, this, this mental chatter, it's just a negative mental habit. Do you know there's a survey done that estimates that 60 to 70% of all mentor chat of all mental chatter is negative that's two-thirds of our thoughts that's crazy so what do we do when catastrophe hits you know when we're when we're on the line and we feel that sort of panic attack bubbling up and we feel the pressure rising and we we feel the anger kind of like soaring through our veins how do we calm ourselves down? Because nobody wants a coworker that just explodes all the time, right? Nobody wants a coworker that cries all the time. So how do we calm ourselves down? First step, we have to tell ourselves it's not happening now. This is a really, really powerful one because it brings you out of your head and back into the moment. I'm gonna expand on that. It brings you out of your head and back in the moment. And this is really helpful because it puts things in focus. It reminds you that I'm at work, I am in control, and I can handle this. Step two, <laughs> we tell ourselves whatever happens, I can cope with it. How many times have you guys just known that you're gonna find a new job? As cooks, we're actually pretty awesomely blessed when it comes to job stability. Although, you know, we don't make any money doing it. We are a profession that's needed universally, you know? So this gives a lot of us our sense of purpose. But it should also give you a sense of confidence because you know that wherever you go in the world, you will be able to find a job as a cook, right? Anywhere in the world, you can find a job as a cook. If you want to, you can make it happen. I've proved this. I've worked in three separate countries and in two of them, I didn't know the language. <laughs> but I learned because cooks are needed worldwide. So you just have to continuously reassure yourself that you can handle this. Give yourself some credit. You've been through worse than whatever is going on right now. And the third, you have to admit to yourself that you're causing your own suffering, that you are caught in a negative mental loop and it is taking over your brain because that's what it is. It's a little fucking spaceship that goes in and casts a net on your brain and then just starts colonizing the entire thing until you can't think straight and you're on autopilot. But you know what? If you stay on autopilot, you stay average. And in this profession, average means you're going nowhere. So what are you going to do about it? So while we're going through this process of calming ourselves down, it's really important to not tell yourself that you have to do something because I mean, you guys, we're cooks. We're all probably, we all probably have a little bit of a rebellious streak in us. And what happens when somebody tells you what to do? Are you going to listen? I sure as shit am not. <laughs> so instead, instead of telling yourself to stop, ask yourself, could you stop? If you're trying to quit smoking, don't say, I have to stop smoking. Ask yourself, could I stop smoking? Am I really that far removed from my actions and my life where I can't control my arms reaching into my pocket, my fingers lifting up a cigarette, my hand lighting it? Could I stop smoking? Could I stop drinking? Is it the bottle's fault? 
Or is it mine for buying it in the first place? Is it mine for going to the bar? Is it mine for picking it up, putting it in a glass, and putting it in my throat? You're responsible for your own suffering, and the sooner you admit this, the sooner your life will change forever. Whew. So what we want to avoid is we want to avoid judging ourselves. And to not judge ourselves, we have to respect ourselves. And if you respect someone, you're not just going to tell them to stop doing something. You're going to ask them nicely if it's possible, if they could do it differently. So start talking to yourself like a friend. Start talking to yourself like a mentor instead of yelling at yourself and berating yourself and putting yourself down all day long. Start relating to yourself with a little bit of compassion. Start trying to understand why you do the things that you do. Start becoming friends with yourself instead of telling yourself that you're just a loser that nobody wants anything to do with. Stop fearing judgment. <laughs> Nobody cares anyway. And people aren't going to like you until you like you. Because nobody likes the mask. Plain and simple. Some people can be fooled by it momentarily. But nobody likes the person who's wearing the mask. Because the person wearing the mask doesn't like themselves. Really... Take that to heart, please. Because this is the most liberating experience when you allow yourself to go through it. Of the experience of self-love is profound and will change your life. And it's really hard to describe. <laughs> but the main thing we want to get across the main thing I want to get across here is that you have a choice. You have a choice how you talk to yourself because you're the one talking to yourself. It's your brain. You can make it do what you want it to do. It's crazy, right? To those of you who've never dealt with the depths of depression and anxiety and you're like, oh, well, duh. I mean, that's just like how we live. <laughs> have a little compassion too. Because not everybody sees the world like you do. And just try and understand where someone's coming from. Learn to connect to people like you connect to food. Because when you have a dish at a restaurant that's super authentic, or when you're on vacation, have, you, have any of you ever been food tourists? This is my favorite thing to do when I travel. I pick a country based on the cuisine that I most want to experience authentically. And so, so far I've, uh, you know, just been Peru and Nepal and Indonesia and Norway, among others, but they're cuisines that I know nothing about because I really love the experience of being culinarily delighted. Because when you work with food for any length of time, you have a tendency to get bored because you see the same shit everywhere. And so I like to go to places where I'm completely unfamiliar with their way of eating and their food and just kind of dive in right away and experience it all. And you can tell with food. You can tell what the pulse of the city is. And non-chefs might think I'm a little insane right now, but you guys know what I'm talking about. You can tell if the food is heavy or if the food is light and fresh. You can tell if it's probably from a cold weather environment or if it's a hot and humid, lazy summer day dish. Like, chefs, you know this. You can picture these things in your head. You know what, if, if somebody came to you and said, I want a summer luau barbecue, you know, you can already conceptualize what kind of dishes make that up because you understand the connection between food and environment and culture. You can tell what dishes in the United States came out of wartime. I grew up in the Midwest and whew, it was all... The uh, box of this, can of this, and jar of this, stick it in the microwave, dump cake sort of 
monstrosities, but that comes from an extreme poverty mindset during wartime. So you guys already know how to do this. You just need to apply it to yourselves in a way that makes sense. But guys, you're more equipped to do this than most other professions. Because the beauty of cooking is that we understand connection on a profound level. We know how ingredients relate together. We can picture tastes in our mind. So if you can picture what a fresh, juicy orange smells like right now, if you can close your eyes, just bear with me, just, just go along with it. Close your eyes and just imagine an orange. Maybe you want to imagine a clementine or a pomelo, whatever you want to do, but imagine your citrus fruit of choice. And really picture it, you know? Picture the roughness of the skin and picture the picture the bumps in it and picture the roundness and how vibrant is it? Is it dark? Is it is it bright? Is it dull? And then smell it. You can smell the uh, you can smell the oil from the skin. You know, when you express a citrus peel and it just whoosh, right in your nose and you can smell nothing but pure, brilliant orange oil. Can you smell it? Can you feel what it feels like to peel it apart? Can you imagine what the segments look like? Can you feel the juice dripping down your hands? Can you imagine picking a piece of this fresh orange up and biting into it and feeling the freshness of it wash over your entire mouth and slowly slide down your throat. You can, can't you? Because you know what an orange tastes like. Also, congratulations, you've just meditated. Now you know you can do it. <laughs> I feel bad for tricking you, but it's really exciting to realize that you already know how to do something, especially when that something, like looking inwards and writing new pictures in our own brains, seemed impossible. But you already do it with food. Now we just need to start doing it with ourselves. We need to start writing better pictures and creating better pictures in our mind. If our life isn't the way that we want it, what needs to change? What needs to go? What needs a lot more focus and attention? Start deconstructing yourself. Start writing it down. Start figuring out who you are and what you're made of, and then start consciously deciding where you want to go next, who you want to be next, how you want to move forward. I'm really excited to see where this goes, guys.